Get ready for a trading revolution. Join me as we delve into a trader's trading plan and rip it apart. We do it with the wonderful Louise Bedford and Don Dawson. Together, we will guide you through the flaws, offer game-changing insights, and share our experience on what works and what doesn't in a trading plan. Prepare to be inspired and motivated. Welcome to the trading plan transformation. Don Dawson here, futures trader, futures author, futures market analyst. Don, just give us a little bit of an idea about what you're looking forward to in this segment. I am actually, you know, I, I instructed futures classes for about 15 years. So I've always felt this give back, you know, I've been, I've been trading for a little over 35 years now. And so giving back is just something I've always enjoyed doing in the futures industry. And, and when this idea came up to sort of collaborate and, you know, dissect the uh, trading plan, I thought this was so fun. I, I just, it, I've been looking forward to this really. Up. Absolutely. And Jordan Maller, Director of Trade Delicious, and of course, your podcast, Traders of Money, that I've been on. And of course, you've been on my podcast as well. Jordan, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, this is something, this is a common problem, which we ran to in my time working for, for the Fivers and Trade the Pool, which two firms of, that analysts start, um, where we'd have a common issue with traders, we'd ask about trading plans and strategies, and there just wasn't any bulk information there and a lot of people struggled to understand exactly what was required in a trading plan and how to structure one so the chance for the three of us to sit down myself not only learn from the two of you who have been trading before i was born <laughs> and uh and to sit down here and to to bring our experience from the firm to to bring a trader forward and and to really learn how to structure these trading plans i think it's a fantastic opportunity Mm, I do too. So let's kick off with some definitions because I think that's really key. With trading plans, that's like an overall business plan that covers what you'll do when you go on holidays, how you'll handle all aspects of trading, including your company structure. And a trading system is the actual specifics of trading, which is your entry, your exit, your position sizing. So your system is a part of that overall overall trading plan and in some massive feat of Marvel and DC type of comic book worthy accomplishment, we are going to do both in this one episode, which is fascinating. And Jordan, just mention how we got Tiago's plan so everybody knows. Yeah, first things first, massive shout out to Tiago for allowing the three of us to absolutely <laughs> gut his trading plan. It's a scary thing to do, and we feel awfully devious for doing this, but but uh, thank you very much. Tiago, when we discussed, the three of us sat down and thought about how we could collaborate to bring this to fruition, um, I was already working with a trader who was struggling with this, so it was a perfect opportunity. I reached out to Tiago and said, hey, are you willing to expose yourself in front of thousands of people? <laughs> Somehow he said yes. <laughs> and we allowed it to do it. So it was just everything fell perfectly into place. And, and I knew I could help Tiago by doing this. And that's how this episode's come about. And so while you're listening to this episode, I want you to think not only about Tiago's plan, because that is one aspect, but how do you apply this for your own specific trading? This is the key. The three of us professionals in the industry, we want you to achieve and to su succeed, but we also want you to take what we've got to apply it and to make sure that you're not falling into some of these ditches that Tiago has fallen into. So even though this has been a very safe space for Tiago, where we have given him a lot of encouragement, we also want to make it 100% clear that we are here to get results. And sometimes results encourages us to be an unreasonable friend, where we have to point out some of these deficiencies, because otherwise you are just running with scissors. So having said all of that, Tiago, please do know that you have our care, but we do need to cut to the Chase. And I think we should start with you, Don. You had a look at a couple of parts of Tiago's plan, and I want you to cover the first aspects that you looked at. I sure will. And I'm looking forward to this. And uh, Tiago, again, thank you very much for doing uh, or volunteering uh, to uh, let us uh, sort of uh, dissect your trading plan. 
Uh, I am a very firm believer in trading plans. So I think, you know, it's one of the things like when I was instructing, we were never allowed to guarantee anybody's success, obviously. But the one thing I did guarantee him was failure without a trading plan. So unfortunately, I've seen that too many times. Um, so this is really, you know, anytime we get a chance to help people with their trading plan and others to create a trading plan, I'm all for it. So, uh, so one of the first questions that we had on here was about, you know, clearly writing out your objectives as a trader. And Tiago wrote back about his basically setting up his trade. And he was looking from, you know, as most of us do from a higher time frame down. And he was looking for a smaller time frame entry inside of that larger time frame. And he also enclosed in here about where his risk was going to be, what percentage of his account he was going to use, which is what we would all want to do. Uh, one thing I might do in our Tiago, and you may have this in your regular trading plan, and maybe you just didn't think too much detail on this one on the answer, but trend is uh, should definitely be in here. I didn't notice anything in there you had uh, about trend, and that's so important to be trading with the trend uh, as a trader. <clears throat> but a couple other things, I just made some notes here too about, you know, literally writing out your objectives. Um, before you start a trading plan, a trader's got to realize what is their goal here? Are they looking for wealth and uh, you know, wealth or are they looking for income to generate? Which one are they looking for? Um, because if you think about it, when you do a trading plan, they're both of those trading styles are going to require um, well, basically, you know, different uh, time frames, right? For one's going to be overnight, maybe wealth could be months, maybe even years of doing wealth building. Capital requirements would be a lot different for both of those as well. Trading styles. I know for me, my daily type of trading is I've got a different trading plan than say my monthly or longer term investing. And then also you're withdrawing cash. When you, as you go into withdrawing cash, as an income trader, you might be doing a monthly withdrawal for paying yourself. With wealth, you might only do maybe maybe not even do an annual or, and never even take money out because you're saving for a longer term goal. So that's what I would be looking at, uh, you know, in the standpoint of uh, determine wealth or income before you even start on a trading plan. Because you kind of got what type of a trader or what are you looking to get out of your, your trading um, there was a comment on there too about, you know, it, it, if you're trading for fun, and I'm not a fan of using that word fun in trading, it's like you word, the word easy. But, um, you know, I always say if somebody's going to trade for fun, why not just go to a casino or donate the money to your favorite charity, because you're going to lose it anyway. And because uh, trading truly is a true business. Traders do have fun when they're trading, but they don't trade just for fun because that's when you're using like your the action, you know, it creates that adrenaline and you're getting, you know, like this rush from that. And this is not the business for that. It's too expensive for that kind of a game. There's other ways to do that. Um, and, you know, what do you want to take away, you know, as, as far as um, the last part up here was like exactly what are you hoping to achieve as a trader? Um, you know, where, what are you um, looking for trading to where you want it to take you to? Um, and it's like, you know, are you looking to replace, create, or supplement an income? Okay, that's something you've got to ask yourself too. Um, and, you know, or you possibly when you get done, or you never really get done learning, but as you go through and you become a better trader, are you possibly looking to go work for a trading firm, like a prop firm or a hedge fund or anything like that as a professional trader? Maybe this is just a stepping stone to get you into that. So that's what, you know, I came up with on uh, as far as your objectives on here uh, to cover um, the next question that we had down in here about how much time per day per week will you be devoting to your trading, which is very important that you do got to get those answered. Um, it says, currently, I'm trying to do this full time is what Tiago is replying. And so I don't have any other distractions. Well, I went, whoa, yeah, you do. <laughs> we all have distractions. I don't care if you're full time, part time or what. Uh, the one thing I recommended was, especially if he was going to be trading from home, was to do something called set your office hours and stick to them. Because <clears throat> anytime we're working at home, we tend to lose track of time. And, you know, we, matter of fact, people who do work at home tend to spend more hours in their office than people who actually go to an office because we really just, we don't have any respect for our private life and that we spend more time in an office environment or in our personal office. So basically, we've got to create those hours and then we got to stick to them. Um, so, but to keep in mind too, when we're creating these hours for trading, there's going to be time for like journaling. you got to have a consistent time of the day. You want to journal. So it becomes a routine for getting that done. Uh, the other one's going to be weekends when you go in to do like for me, it's Sunday afternoons, getting ready for the upcoming week. I tend to spend a little bit more time that um, afternoon going through my analysis. So that's got to be incorporated in there as well. Um, and also there's going to be time for when you want to sit down and read, uh, you know, maybe some of Louise's articles, for example, or something, but anything of trading related. And there's so many videos out there now that you can watch and, and, and actually pick up on uh, learning about trading as well. So, so that's all part of the time you're going to devote to. It's not just to sit there clicking while you're trading. There's so much more involved to it than just that. Um, 
The other one down here about how do you avoid some of these or overcome some of the distractions. If you're going to be doing the office at home type of a thing, you need to advise family members and friends, look, these are my office hours. I cannot be disturbed during this time unless it's an emergency because it's too easy for family to kind of take advantage of that thing. Oh, he's here. I'm going to go talk to him or she, whichever it is. Um, the other thing is to list the items you're going to disconnect from during your trading session, i.e. emails, okay? I had a bad habit of doing that in my earlier days. As soon as I heard the computer go ding, I had to roll my chair over and go like, hey, what's that email? Like it meant anything. Half the time, it was nothing. But the point is we we have to write out things like that, uh, you know, and no internet surfing unless it's trading related to something like a news break that came out and you want more information. But even that's not the right time to be doing it. So so let's, you know, if we're in there to trade, we should have our, you know, our, our business hat on and just focus on business and trying to limit as much personal interference uh, that we could possibly get throughout the trading day. Yeah, I'm a big fan because especially from my experience trading from home for the past seven years, there is that element where someone will just walk in at the worst possible time and have a chat or expect you to do something because you're at home all day. Uh, these are things you, you definitely need to analyze. What I really found interesting, and I, I want to double back to your objectives question there as well. I, I wrote a couple of notes on it because for me, when I analyze my trading plan. And when I really get involved in trading, I see it as a project manager. I see it from a project manager point of view. It's kind of who I am, right? You ask my business partners, they'll be like, yes, he's got spreadsheets for everything. Okay. It's kind of the way that I I function in that aspect. And I want to go through Tiago's answer where we, we asked him to clearly define what his objectives were. And he come through and said, I'm trading because I want more free time to do things that really matter to me. What I want to challenge Tiago in the way that you say this is great great idea, right? Great, great fantasy in order to get to, but there's no goal setting in there. I mean, when you say you want more free time, how much free time do you want? How many hours do you want available to be able? There's no way of setting goals to push towards more free time without it being defined. Following on from there, you said, my focus on creating a skill that will allow me to have enough money to create a business. How much money? How much money is enough money to create that business? When we start to really solidify these objectives, it gives us a greater opportunity to break it down and understand exactly what you have to go through in order to get that. So I'm going to run you through some just classic project management <laughs> standards here. Smart objectives. If, if, if you guys have ever heard about smart objectives, I think it still comes into trading. It's all about specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, relevant and time bound. That's all your objectives. And I think in trading, as hard as it can be to time bound a couple things and everything, I think the goals need to be set there where you can see that it is achievable and you can see the timeline and what you need to achieve in order to do that. Simple project management, general management techniques. By incorporating all of these elements into your trading plan, you'll have a clearer roadmap on how to get there. Quantifying your goals is possibly the biggest way of doing this from first steps. I've broken this down into three steps with this question and quantifying is the first one. So once again, going back to how much is enough money for you to do the things you want to do. Now, I, I want to mention this. Tiago did mention that the reason he wants to create this business is to help his community and actually help a lot of homeless people as well. So I just feel absolutely horrid for ripping into <laughs> Tiago's plan right now because you can see your heart's in the right place, your motivation's there. But as Louise stated, we're not here to be good people right now. We are here to get results and we want to see you get results. And the reality of the situation is we need to put that hard work in. It's like trying to create a business without any idea or vision on where that business is, doing any research on the market, doing any research on consumers. It's just blind running. And when we aim for objectives that aren't quantifiable, we're never going to approach them. We're never going to reach them because there will always be more time or more things to do or more distractions. The second thing, once you've quantified those goals, once you've figured out exactly how much they are, define a timeline. I want you to dig in and give yourself a broad spectrum of when you want to achieve it by. Very simple thing to do. Yes, harder to achieve. It's okay if you fall short. It's okay if you beat expectations, but having the timeline allows you to break it all down into actionable steps that you can take, whether it's daily, whether it's weekly, whether it's quarterly, but the actionable steps and allow you to actually establish 
benchmarks, which is one of the most important part in trading. Alongside the financial goal of where you want to get and the free time and everything else comes through, having benchmarks to measure your progress in line with where you're trying to get those smart goals not only increases your motivation to attend to it, but it can also increase the amount of time that you really look at your performance and you analyze how well am I achieving or what do I need to do better? Where do I need to do better in order to still attend those goals that I set when I started out training? So as hard as it can be to dive into that inner project manager, uh, and I know it's not the most interesting thing that, that everyone likes to talk about, I think it's paramount to success. I think it's really important that you do dive into these areas and you do have a deeper understanding on where you're actually traveling with this business because it is a business. Don't get me wrong. This is 100% a business, arguably harder than running other businesses. <laughs> <laughs> right? a lot of this a lot of the thing especially when you're a one one man or one woman army it gets even harder so um yeah having those smart goals 100 is something that stood out that i want you to to really dive into and this goes out for everyone else listening as well if this resonates do it as well trust me it'll blow your mind in the clarity of of thought that you'll get post that moving mm. into that and this kind of correlates is we asked Tiago how he's going to measure his performance as a trader. Now, Tiago comes from an FX CFD background, which is where I've specialized. So this works really well in the way that he, that he analyzes the charts. I can get a deeper understanding on what he's talking. I know, Don, you're from a futures background. Louise, you're from a stock trading background. There's a bit of a mix here, but um, I, I can get a deeper understand. He stated that he's measuring his performance based on RR, which is risk to reward. Okay, It's risk to reward per trade. And then at the end of the month, he's studying the results to see the gap between his trading plan, his trading strategy, and his performance. First things first, love the aspect of analyzing them both separately. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing this. I've done it all my trading career, having what the strategy should have done and what you had done, uh, because that'll give you a clear understanding on where the issue is, okay? Uh, having that separate, fantastic, love that. I want to challenge your thought of only using risk to reward. That is simply one metric of a whole trading system. And I think it's lacking a little bit. So I want to use more metrics. I want you to consider drawdown size, win rate, um, return on investment. Like there is a million different metrics in which we can look into as a trader. And I want you to create a full holistic view of your trading plan and then track those individually because where you might lack on your risk to reward ratio your win rate might be really high or your you know and where the risk to reward ratio is down as long as your win rate's higher than 50 percent, you're still going to be making profit so it's that element of sticking in one area not a massive fan of let's get a complete holistic view and then set specific targets back to those smart objectives, set specific targets on those individual aspects of your trading plan, your risk to reward ratio, your return on investment, your drawdown size, have specific set objectives for those. So if you start getting a little bit close to your drawdown, you're going to alter your position sizing. You're going to relax a little bit. You're going to change a couple of things to ensure that you're not going to hit those different targets. And when you start making these altercations as your trading plan as a whole, you'll see it kind of moves like a sphere puzzle. You've seen those like, um, I'm going to lose myself in trying to think what that is. But you see that the spheres that, that always are moving, uh, I slip my mind. But that's what your trading plan should look like. Yes, all aspects are constantly moving, but they're all in sync and it all looks synchronized. And, and that's really important. Then finally, the quarterly and the each month review uh, on how you've gone, fantastic, fantastic. The fact that you're willing, you've already announced that you're going to do it. Now, I've had plenty of people over my time tell me they're going to do it, whether they do it or not. That's a whole nother story. Um, but if you are really committed to doing that, fantastic. I challenge you on going even quicker, even into weekly reviews. By the sounds of things, you're a day trader, okay? You're trading intraday, you're in the charts a lot. You're taking two, three, four, five trades a day. So I want you to have a look at some of these reviews on the metrics from a weekly standpoint, because while you're doing it quarterly, which is still very important to do, you might be able to pick up on a couple trends or a couple of mishaps earlier on and prevent more damage to your account. If you can pick up that you're not trading the way you should be, 
in a week spectrum, you can reset your mind and the next week you can go back to how you should be trading. Whereas if you're doing it quarterly, you might go a whole month trading wrong and you won't be able to get that account back or it's going to be a lot harder to get that money back in the market. So um, <laughs> as a whole, to sum up, smart objectives by far the biggest biggest thing that I could recommend for anyone in their trading plan and then setting those measurable goals and following them, reviewing them. It is literally, you are a project manager as a trader. In my eyes, I think that's how you should stick to it. And I think that's how you should run the business. Wow, you guys. Oh, so <laughs> while you're listening to this podcast, look for the similarities between what each of us is saying, because that is probably the core essence of what makes it tick to become an exceptional trader. And really, with the information that you've already been provided, you're being told to summarize very effectively what is the trend to you so that you can develop an archetypal trade and match future future trades to that. You're also being looking at objectives. You're looking at the objectives that you have, which can determine your timeframes. So what timeframes are you going to trade and how are you going to evaluate your performance? So look, guys, I've got a couple of questions before, before I move on to my ones. Don, do you look at an archetypal trade, that perfect trade that you're trying to match others to? How do you define what trend means to you? Yeah, for me, trend is when I you know started out trading, I stumbled. I was a five-year self-taught trader, so I, I felt like I stumbled for a long time. But I felt once I got trend under control, I, I, when I call it trend under control, meaning every day when I come into trade, I will not trade against a trend. So I'm either going to be a buyer, I'm going to be a seller, I'm not going to trade at all if there's no trend. So for me, that's very, very important. And I'm very rule-based too. So my trading plan, I was going to actually mention on, on Jordan's comment about spreadsheets and stuff. I like to get people to be thinking in terms of trading plans to be like a flow chart. Have you ever noticed on a flow chart, there's never a maybe or a kinda or a sort of, it's either yes or no before you move to the next section. And that to me is how a trading plan really should be is that that particular, you know, yes or no, you don't want gray in your trading plan. Because if you have any gray in your trading plan in the heat of the moment, you have to answer a question. And we all know how that usually turns out not very well for us. Mm, absolutely. And for everybody following along, we do have the ability to put this into our show notes. So this will be on talkingtrading.com.au's show notes, which will show Tiago's plan, but also some of the questions that we're answering right now. And Jordan, where are you going to publish the show notes on your sites? This will be in the uh, YouTube description. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, feel free to just head into the Trade Delicious description below and you'll see all of the notes there. Excellent. Jordan, I like what you're saying about the SMART goals. The only difficulty I find with that is that sometimes that can make you force a trade. So you're thinking that I have to achieve this much this week and it makes you think I better find a trade to do that with and it can make you force that trade even though an actual trading example was not apparent in that chart. What would your thoughts on that be? It'd be the aspect of putting less emphasis on profit. Um, we, we're traders, right? We, we're, we're based on probability. Trying to achieve a certain number of profits is a really hard thing to do. We can still use those smart objectives to get an understanding on win rate, on risk to reward ratio, on how we're trading and why we're trading. The market's going to do what the market's going to do, right? As long as we stick to our plan and trade it long enough, as long as we've got an edge, we'll gain profit. So, It'll be that aspect of less resilient or, or reliant, should I say, um, on the actual profit itself, but more set these targets on how you conduct your trading, what it is you're doing, and how consistent you are as a trader. The market will deliver when the market wants to deliver, but we need to be consistent within ourselves. So that's what I would uh, really push on there. Those smart objectives should be things that are within our control, not without our control. Magic. That's exactly the way I would have answered that too, frankly, Jordan. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so let's have a look at another couple of questions. I, I had a look at the procedures that Tiago is following. And also, if you experience a consecutive string of losses, how will you react? Now, we know that when we're having a consecutive string of losses, that our self-talk can end up 
in the gutter. We start saying things to ourselves that we would never say to a friend of ours and we would never expect to repeat outside of the private domain of our mind because it would involve quite a few swear words and we haven't put an explicit warning on this particular podcast. So I won't say what goes through my mind when I make a consecutive string of losses. I think with this, this is where we can really benefit from creating an if then statement. Now this is taken straight from the computer industry and it was also replicated in the weight loss industry. (laughs) If then statements. So if this happens, then I will. Now the key with a trading plan is to say, if I experience this number of losses, or for me, if I have a drawdown of 25% or more, then I will stop entering new trades and allow the others to run to their stop and consult a higher authority. And I have got listed people that I will consult if I end up in that situation. Now, what this lets you do is firstly, if you do have a spouse, it lets you you explain to your spouse that it's okay, I have got an overall stop loss on my entire portfolio and an action plan. That action plan tells me what to do if everything falls through. You know, sometimes we are out of sync with the markets. Sometimes it can be that the markets are changing direction and that can be a difficult time, but it can also be that something without in our own personal life can lead to some difficulties. Often for me, the warning sign is if I'm saying, Oh my gosh, I don't have time for this. Okay, if that's ever my thought bubble, then I know I'm under pressure. So that is something that we need to post-mortem and pre-mortem around. So pre-mortem is where we think about in advance, how will we handle this dire situation? And I'm suggesting an if-then statement. And a post-mortem is what Jordan was talking about, where we look at what happened and we look to see how has that analysis not only going to help us right now, but how is it going to help us in the future based on our past behaviour. So that's my first piece of advice. I would add in an if then statement. I know also you've said with your consecutive string of losses that you're looking to increase your win rate I, as your reasonable friend, have to take umbrage at that. (laughs) Increasing our win rate is not the name of the game. I know this is counterintuitive. I know it seems very strange. I have had option writers have a 98% win rate, then get wiped out by the 2% where they made massive losses. Increasing our win rate is a feel-good metric. But in actual fact, if you look at the group like the Turtles, the most successful trading group in the world, they have a win rate of 35%. And do you know why? It's because they pile into the ones that are winning. They pyramid in heavily and they make sure that they cut their losses very quickly. Now, I would suggest that you have a slight shift in your mindset about win rate. That is going to foul you up because once your win rate drops, you're going to think you are unworthy. And that can be a cascade and a spiral down into the depths of trading disgust in your mind. And we don't want to be there. So that is something to consider. And the other thing is I would be careful about your assumptions here. Often with day traders, I warn about burnout. Now people think, oh, well, isn't that for older people? Isn't that for people who are taking on too much outside their lives? No, this is a very true and real aspect for traders. If you are trading very frequently because you are trying to maintain that average win rate, that can have a massive impact in terms of decision fatigue. And it can not only decrease the veracity of your decisions, but it can also have a very big physiological 
physiological basis of running down that dopamine system. Not only will you not get those nice dopamine squirts when you're actually doing the right thing, but your cortisol can increase, which make, makes you less apparent in terms of spotting patterns, being able to add up figures. It has an impact on our algebraic function in our brain. And really cortisol is the risk because those with higher cortisol, poorer decisions, but poorer health outcomes as well. So I would like to see some way of you pushing into your plan that balance that Don was suggesting. How are you going to manage this as a part of your life? I think that's an, a real concern here. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, Jordan. Have you found that? Because I know we're in different markets. What are your thoughts about average win rate? Yeah, well, it, it all, as I mentioned, the, the spheric, right? It, it all calculates for each other. Focusing on just one of these things is, is a terrible way to go about business because you could, as you've mentioned, you could have a win rate of 98%, but if your risk to reward ratio, you win a dollar for every $2,000 you lose, I mean, long-term, it's still not going to be great. It's all about that edge and that probability. So 100% agree with you there. Uh, it, it goes back to that where uh, Tiago is focusing on just risk to reward. I'm like, there's a whole holistic view you need to get an understanding of what you're doing in order to keep that all captivated and keep it all in one place so um yeah couldn't couldn't agree more now i have a couple of extra points to consider tiago i'd like you to also consider portfolio heat now portfolio heat good traders have around a five percent to a seven percent some up to a ten percent portfolio heat if you've got a one percent risk then that means you can only open five positions so five times 1% to get to your 5%, five positions before that position reaches your break even stop. Now, what this does is it, it helps you stop from that, I'm out of sync with the market, I've just put all in, and now I'm going to absolutely squash my equity curve. The way you squash a Coke can, I've seen it happen. So portfolio heat will prevent you from entering too many positions in the beginning before they hit their break even stop. I'd also like you to consider an anti martingale approach. This is where when we're winning, when we're making profits, we create the space for larger position sizes. Now you can do that with those smart objectives where you're looking at the analysis after you're out of trades, you add up all of your money that you have in the market value to stop, plus the equity in your bank account and use that figure as your new position sizing base. Now, I know if you're a new trader, I have just blown your head off. I understand. The good thing with podcasts is you can listen to it again and again, and there will be information, not only in Jordan's notes, but in my notes as well. I'd like you to also measure your equity curve. With an equity curve, it's telling you how much money you're making. That is really the core. You know, you can have wonderful figures, but if you can't feed your family at the end of the day, you're going to be jeopardized as a full-time trader. And I do like the idea, I know Don, you used it slightly differently, but I like the idea of a flow chart with your results management. That is a real key as well. I've seen people create beautiful flow charts to say, here are my daily, my weekly, my monthly, my yearly activities, and they tick them off as if they're a checklist. And that can be a wonderful thing as well. Now, Don, I'd like to flick over to you now. I know you've got another couple of things you'd like to say about the trading plan. I'd love to hear your views. Okay. Yeah, that would definitely want to cover that. Um, I, I was going to touch on one thing before I start on this. And uh, Jordan, we were talking about benchmarks. And, you know, one of the things I ran into a lot of times was how people compare themselves to other traders, you know, for a benchmark. And that's probably the worst thing any trader could do. Um, I can tell you from my experience, what I've liked to do is like here in the United States, we have treasury bills, which are, you know, decent interest rate on short term, short term money. Uh, we have the stock indexes like the S&P 500. So what I used to do on that was I would use a T-bill interest rate, for example, 
back when it was a really good number. It's pretty good today, but I mean, when it got down to zero, that wasn't a very fair benchmark. But I would look at it like that, and then I could even go into like the S and P's on a quarterly basis, for example, and I would compare my performance to that as a benchmark. And my my idea was that if I'm not beating that or close to those uh, what they're doing on their averages, then I should have the majority of my money in an index fund, for example, and not in my trading account until I get to the point where I can be matching or beating that. Because in the end, it's all about making money. It's not about how you do it, but about making the money. And if you're not performing well in the trading business, you're not ready to be jumping in with both feet and all your money. So until you get that good, that's when you can you know, start doing it. So that's why I like about a benchmark of a, another market and never another individual. I think that's a very dangerous or slippery slope to go into. Um, so anyway, the other thing, there was a question here about what size percentage returns are you expecting per annum? And this is always a good question to ask people because it's all over the place. And uh, it's, it's funny because when I was reading it here, I have to give him kudos. Tiago did a great thing on this. It says, I had to readjust my expectations recently and I'm trying not even, uh, I'm trying not to even have any. I'm like, thank you. That's the first I've heard somebody actually come out and say that because that in the end is what it really should be. Because it, as you guys were mentioning earlier, we have no control over profit targets, absolutely none. All we control is risk, how much we're willing to lose, right? So when you set these type of animals here, you know, for targets, it's, it's just crazy, you know, be, because you're really putting a lot of pressure on yourself. And when you get behind on that goal, what do you do? You cheat and you catch, you know, trying to catch up and you end up losing even more money. So I, that kind of pressure is not needed because then he, can, he finishes it with saying, I would say something between 20 and 40%, which you could tell he's just grabbing in the air, trying to pull something in. If you've been trading long enough, there's a, a Barclay Hedge, uh, which is a sort of a, um, a company that follows hedge funds and, and tracks their performances and stuff. For the past five years, hedge funds have only returned 7.2%. 7.2%. But his goal was 20 to 40%. See, and I've learned that myself over the years, setting these like, oh, I should be able to double my account every two years or three years. That's nonsense because if you win all the time, sure, that's what's going to happen. But just like we were talking about, you're not going to win all the time. You're probably going to have a few more losers than you will uh, winners. So all this averages out at the end of the year. That's how these single digit returns come out. So when you're trying to get 20 and 40%, it's almost like, putting so much pressure on yourself because I, I don't truly believe you can get that on a consistent basis. Uh, and we'll talk about that on another one coming up here about handling windfall profits. Uh, and if you get something of 20, 40% for me, it's time for you to go on holiday <laughs> because you're going to give your money all back. So, but anyway, um, but the other thing is we can only control our capital at risk, as I'd mentioned there just a moment ago, but never to profits. And I, I don't set monetary goals. I use those benchmarks that I was just talking about. So for me, that's how I would get through, um, you know, what size percentage returns are you expecting per annum? I, um, yeah, I got my benchmarks that I use. And my goal is perfect. I got a, a saying I keep on my monitor over there is perfect the execution, not the results. So if I perfect the execution of my trading plan, the results will take care of themselves. And that's my, you know, that's what I'm going to make. I, and Jordan, you pointed it out too. The market doesn't care. We're, that doesn't care how much we need, how much we want. It's going to give us what we're going to give us when it wants to. So we have to trade sort of nimbly while the market's not giving us anything. And when it is getting ready, as Louise was pointing out, pile in. When we know, you know it's going our way, let's make some money. So that's how I would look at that, uh, what percentage returns we're expecting per annum uh, question. Um, the other one was, how would you handle uh, windfill, wind, windfall profits? And uh, he had this interesting answer. He put, that's very hard to happen because I uh, always have target points set. So the profits that I take for each trade are expected. So he's automatically sort of zeroing in on just a trade or two and not a series of trades, okay? So time away from the screen after a significant series of wins is going to be a good idea because if you think about if you have a series of wins, you can still have a windfall, right? I mean, if just for some lucky thing, you happen to get 100 heads in, or not 100, maybe 40 heads in a row and you're flipping the coin, luck happens, right? But at some point, we win too much money and we get careless with it. We start treating it like house money. It's not our money. I didn't work for it. It just came to me. And you start getting really sloppy with it. You start using analysis techniques like, you know, you'll, you'll start using stochastics and you don't even know how to spell it just because you got this extra money floating around, right? So to me, I think you get really careless when you got a lot of money uh, floating around in your trading account. So if you, you look at it from that standpoint, I put on here about knowing the average hedge funds only doing like 7.2%. 
what if you as a trader said, if I do three or four times that in a, in a year, then I should take a holiday during that, you know, such as say mid year, you're up 30%. Okay. Something like that or 31, maybe just go take a nice holiday and enjoy some of that money that you've made and come back and you'll come back, you know, being nice and refreshed, if you will, for coming into trading. So I, I think that would be my answers to uh, his, you know, how to handle a windfall profit, no matter whether you're a day trader or a, a swing trader, income, wealth, you, you could easily hit us, not easily, but you can hit a string of profits that would result in a windfall. I'm I'm a massive fan of that benchmark aspect because I have so many people come into my my streams uh, over at Trade Delicious and they'll ask you know what did you earn last month what do you try and earn every month what should I be aiming to earn every month and they'll be like we're not talking money we're talking percentages I'm like well <laughs> same thing right like it, we're in we're in finance here and it's that aspect of everyone wants expectations. Like how can I build such a, an elaborate trading plan without an expectation on what I can achieve? And it's like, I understand where you're coming from, but if you work in that headspace of, I expect, I expect, I expect, you're just going to be disappointed, 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 because it's not going to come that way. If you really want to get some realistic forecasts in that aspect, just review your previous trading. Review your previous trading, review your strategy, your back testing, everything. That right there has the answer on what you can forecast. That's the only way you can do that. Other than that, benchmarking, I've always benchmarked against the indices. Um, yeah. So 100% having that aspect of if I outperform the indices, fantastic. I really consider that as a great year if I outperform yeah. the indices because I mean, I outperform the market. Uh, who's not That's going to be happy market, about outperforming exactly. the market? Um, yeah, and when, when you see traders that are aiming for 10% a month and, and they want to do it consistently, oh, it's, it's mind-blowing that um, and it's it's unfathomable and it's, it's not something you really want to be aiming for long-term. Oh, my gosh, we're all on the same page because I have to say this is how I do it as well. There's so many aspects that spring to mind with this. One of them is that I have difficulty capping my profit. So I actually ride the trend up and mm -hmm. I set a trailing stop. And because of that method, I know other people use different methods and I do take on board what you're saying, Don, but I prefer for, for myself at my stage of life where I'm looking to ride medium to long-term trends, I actually extend out that trailing stop for years. So it will go on and on and on as long as that baby is still trending, it has my attention and it has my money and I've probably pyramided into the max as well. So that to me allows for an easier life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it does. It really does. You know, there's that saying, there are no old, bold traders. <laughs> and that is an aspect here. If I was trading so actively the way that I did perhaps many years ago, I wouldn't have been able to hang in there and go the distance. So for me, playing with your parameters around your system is one aspect. Thinking about how you're thinking is another aspect. And then the last one is maintenance. So we've got system, psychology, and maintenance. And they are the three major tweaks that you can use in terms of a structure and a framework for trading that can really help. Actually, I do like this quote by Jesse Livermore. He's amazingly famous, a bit of a tragic life with his family, but an incredible trader. And I just want to quote this. It was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always my sitting. Got it? Sitting <laughs> right. tight. So I do feel that we need to adjust our expectations about what the market can provide. Be ready and educated so that when the opportunity strikes, we are absolutely ready to launch you want right. all of your broker accounts set up you want your system completely defined you want your trading plan at the ready so that when the market does open that space for you to get in you're like a sniper and you jump in now guys i have had the best episode with you two i have loved it so much it is another way of looking at the markets when we have traders from different markets and different time frames all vying for attention and using the one trading plan as a focus. Don, can you tell people how they can get in touch with you? 
Like, was that me for yeah, Jordan? Or? Go Don. Oh, I'm sorry. It's your moment <laughs> in the spotlight. Yeah, hey, there we go. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it would probably be through uh, email. Would probably be the easiest. Um, I don't have a I don't have a school of my own or anything like that. So I'm, I don't really I, I really just come out and I do these just be I like sharing knowledge and uh, and just talking with people like you guys and you know sharing this stuff. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, my email would be at uh, 87 trader at uh, gmail.com uh, could be reached there uh, when I write articles for a company called barchart.com on their website. Uh, I write a, once a week, I write an article in there and it's usually, you know, related to seasonality of the markets. And also I try and give education along with uh, what the market might possibly do. And I never make predictions on the market, but I say it's one of those, if this, then that type of scenarios. And then I, you know, that way next year, when the pattern comes around, if you read the article and you learn from it, you'll be prepared to react to it uh, on your own for the next year. So, so other than that, uh, that's really all I do. I don't do too much on the social media or anything. Well, LinkedIn, I, I should say I'm on there, but uh, nothing else. That was it. Well, Don, that this displays your heart, that you're willing to give so openly and that you're looking to help people meet them where they're at. And I love that. And Jordan, tell us more about your people's background in terms of where do you hang out with your traders and how can my traders get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I first just wanted to note um, that I'm not as kind as Don. Uh, I'm here for no, I'm joking. <laughs> but it sits me up there. No. We know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to highlight, like you said, Louise, how fantastic it is that the three of us have come from completely different backgrounds. We've different types of trading, different experiences, different stories, yet we all have so much symmetry on what a trading plan needs to be and what it highlights. And I think that's powerful within itself when people are listening to this. If your trading plan isn't quite up to scratch or you're sitting there in the back of your mind, you're really thinking, hey, maybe this, you know, maybe I do need to do some work. Action times now. Action times now. Start doing out, reach out, talk to people, listen to this episode. Once again, it's been recorded. Listen to this episode again and really branch that out. I think it's really important. Me, myself, um, I'm the director over at Trade Delicious. You can find us at tradedelicious.com or on YouTube. We do a lot of live streams talking with the community all about trading. And I'm also the host of Traders of Money podcast, where I speak to experts like the two of you. And we extract all of that valid information to bring uh, to, to traders out there who are attempting to do the unbeatable. Mm. And we do need help, don't we? Because you're right, the markets are a massive adversary for us. We do need to work out ways that we can be that sniper and get the results that we are after. Now, I'm Louise Bedford from talkingtrading.com.au. Now, if you're on Jordan's website or perhaps his group on YouTube and you'd like to get in touch, you can come to visit me and become a subscriber of talkingtrading.com.au and also you can get my free trading plan template which we used as a basis for Tiago's plan my template can be found at tradinggame.com.au so come download that free trading plan template and I'll also give you my trading made simple audio course so guys it has just been absolutely a pleasure any parting words no, no, I think uh, everything's out there. I think it's, well, from me anyway, I think it's time for, for you guys who are listening to start putting in the work, do the action. We've, we've given you our experiences. We've had a good time along the way. It's over to you.